And I'd firstly like to welcome everyone to uh, this Mindfulness Wales session. As you probably know, we have these quite regularly, about once a month. And uh, we have all sorts of uh, fascinating people. Today we have Tim Durden. I'll say something more about him in a moment and introduce him properly. My name is Vishpapani. I'm one of the trustees of Mindfulness Wells. Liz Williams at the top of your screen and Gwen and Roberts are also trustees. And our role really as Mindfulness Wells is, is with a focus on Wales to really support um, the development of mindfulness in the whole country, in the whole of, the whole of Wales um, and beyond. If you're not in Wales, we're still welcome to join us. And that also includes the needs of the mindfulness movement and, and the way that things change and uh, what's helpful to those of us who are teaching and that sort of thing. I'll mention that next, the next session we have on the 19th of uh, July is with Becca Crane from the Bangor Center uh, for Mindfulness Research and Practice with some others who've, and they've written a paper looking at um, issues around exclusion and making mindfulness uh, protocols um, relevant to a multicultural society with all of, all, all of its needs. So that's the next one we have. But today I'm very pleased to, in, to have um, Tim Durden with us. So I think what I'll do now is spotlight myself and Tim, and then I'll remove my own spotlight. So let me see if we can do that. Okay. So I'll just spotlight myself while I introduce Tim. Yes, yeah, so I... Um, actually known Tim for a little while. We, we, we did our mindfulness training in Breathworks uh, quite a long time ago. And Tim has been at the University of Salford, um, where he's now a senior lecturer. He's been there for many years, training counsellors and psychotherapists with a particular focus on mindfulness. And he and his colleagues have really uh, developed material around uh, trauma-sensitive mindfulness, trauma sensitivity. So I, I uh, did a training with him via Breathworks. I, I am a Breathworks trainer, among other things. And I confess that um, trauma sensitivity is one of the, it produced, it touched the Daily Mail reader within, if I just say that. The sort of thoughts like health and safety gone mad, and I'm sensitive to my mindfulness students and so on. But Tim was so clear and um, just made it all make so much sense and so relevant to what I actually know as a mindfulness teacher, which is that I am I and we are dealing with vulnerable people. Um, and it was, I found it very, very helpful. So I'm really delighted that Tim has been able to join us tonight and we'll be sharing some of his thoughts and some of the, the work that has been going on um, among his colleagues and, and actually has already had a very big influence on the mindfulness field. It certainly changed how I teach. So I'm going to remove my spotlight and hand over to Tim. Tim's an, a very uh, experienced teacher and will be in his hands from now on. I feel like I'm now duty bound to offer crushing disappointment to singularly fail to live up to uh, Vishwapani's very kind words there. So um, thanks so much uh, for that introduction, Vishwapani. Um, shall we do a bit of practice to start off with and maybe then get into a little bit more about um, the kind of way I want to structure this? And, and in a way, I want to start with that practice perhaps a good flavour of some approaches I might take to introducing um, a trauma sensitive or we, in some ways I prefer the, just the name <clears throat> to name it person centred approach where we are emphasising personal choice in people's um, uh, 
experiences of, of, of moving into practice. So what I'm going to suggest we do, and this is probably very familiar practice to many of you, is one where we um, notice some stuff. So notice maybe something you can see or a few things you can see. Maybe some things we can hear and maybe something that you can make contact with. The good one can be something you can hold in your hand or it could be maybe the feeling of contact between the soles of your feet and the floor or or something, maybe the seat you're sitting in. So maybe just take a moment to start off with and just check into what it might be like to do a bit of that. Are you OK with having a look at some stuff? Maybe you are, maybe you're not. So looking at something around you. What about listening? Is that kind of OK to listen into something that you can hear right now? And what might be OK is something to make contact with, maybe an object you could hold in your hands, for instance, or something else that you can make some contact with. If you drink a cup of tea, perfect, or water, ideal thing to be maybe holding. And if there's anything in terms of what you might be looking at or listening to <clears throat> or making contact with, you think, hmm, not for me right now, then please just kind of skip on by that bit. Make those choices to be less engaged in that part of it. It might be just think, actually, you know what? Mindfulness right now for me isn't what I want to do. I'm going to have a little strategic snooze or a um, daydream about something, plan something in your mind. At any point during this practice, you think, no, this isn't for me right now. Please do just make those choices to say, you know what, I'm going to do something else. And and I think I really like to emphasize that is a really mindful, compassionate choice to say, you know what, this isn't for me. And I might have a bit of a half a awareness of what's going on, but I'm not going to jump in. I'm not going to fully engage in that. And to recognize that feeling hmm, not so sure I'm going to hold back is to honor that and to and to really uh, follow that feeling if that's around so with all that said um <clears throat> to maybe start off then with a bit of looking at stuff so maybe you could pick out something you could see could be nearby could be something you're holding in your hands could be at a distance through window you spot something <clears throat> and notice maybe the colour of it, the shape of it. Is it moving? Is it still? Just be kind of curious, you know, kind of everyday sort of way. Just, oh yeah, that's, I'm looking at that stuff here. <clears throat> you might find you like to keep your eyes just really steady on that object and one particular part of it. Well, you might find you quite like moving your eyes around the edges of the object. <clears throat> or possibly you might find moving yourself in relationship, moving your head a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me, as I'm doing. Kind of keeps the object alive in your vision, just keeping it moving in relationship to yourself a little bit. And what you probably find is your attention will wander off, maybe because I'm burbling on here, it's caught by think about what I'm saying. How is it when you notice your attention has wandered away from what you're looking at to bring your attention back to what you're looking at there? And there'll probably come a point when you think, well, you know what, I've had enough of looking at that particular thing, I might like to shift to look at something else. And what's it like to choose to shift your attention to something else you can see? Picking something else out. And then again, the colour, the shape, is it moving. How do I want to engage with that kind of in a steady way or a more kind of active way around that? And again, when your attention gets caught by something, how is it to bring it back to just what you're looking at there in an easygoing kind of way? Then maybe one last look at something else, maybe picking out something else to see. Again, doing the same kind of thing. 
gently coming back when our attention's caught by something else. Focusing in when we focus there. And then how is it to maybe <clears throat> notice what it's like to take our attention from looking, maybe still having your gaze resting somewhere, but now bring listening, if that feels comfortable for you, more into the kind of foreground. So picking out a sound you can hear. Focusing in on the details of that sound. And like before, when your attention wanders off, how is it to come back to that particular sound? Then maybe shifting your attention to pick out another sound. Now, if there isn't any other sound to hear, just stay with that one. But is there another one you could shift to and focus in on that? And come back to that when your attention wanders off elsewhere. And then finally, maybe noticing how it is to shift away from listening into making contact there's maybe something you can feel in your hands, could be in your feet or maybe chair you're in, some sense of contact. Focusing in on that. So looking and listening now more in the background, feeling that sense of contact more in the foreground, the details of that. Maybe you're holding <clears throat> that sense of contact with stillness, or maybe there's some movement there. Either's fine. Experimenting. Again, when your attention wanders off to something else, how is it to come back to that sense of a feeling of contact? And what we've been doing now is giving a little bit of a test drive to some different ways of paying attention to what we're physically sensing, looking, listening, feeling, sense of contact. If you reflect back on those, does any stand out? You think, you know, it's just a bit easier to focus in on that, a bit easier to come back to that one. Is it listening more than looking or looking more than feeling contact or feeling contact more than the others or maybe they're all a bit equal who knows maybe if there is one that stands out just having one final go of that just focusing in to that particular sense noticing the details that are there And when your attention wanders off, coming back to that particular sensation, physical sense, in an easygoing, gentle way. Okay, and then maybe bring that to an end, perhaps bring some more movement in, some mix, maybe shifting position a bit, stretching, looking around a bit. I'd be curious, actually, I don't know if it's possible to go to a more kind yeah. of um, matrix view on, yeah. the, on the cameras. Or whatever the name of that might be. Gallery view. Gallery view, thank you. And I'd be really interested to find out different kind of impressions from, from that. So I'm still seeing mainly me rather than um we go or do i have to change it ah. i'm not sure i've been spotlighted 
I've removed the spotlight. Oh, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If folk are seeing a kind of more of a gallery view, you may need to change that the little button on the top right. Um, you might need to click to go to the, the gallery view. Anyway, well, I'd be really interested. Those who okay with cameras, can we use our hands to indicate some feedback about kind of our experiences? So if we could have a thumbs up would be a yes, thumbs down a no, and then a mm, what the hell are you talking about? Not sure, kind of wobbles somewhere in the middle. If cameras aren't good for you, you could use the reactions and if you click on the reactions button at the bottom you'll see in the emojis there's thumbs up thumbs down and i don't know use something random and interesting for the not sure so uh so the first question i'd like to ask is and i'm kind of pitching this like a mite to a more kind of introductory sort of group i suppose is first of all just to ask Kind of who here noticed that their attention wandered off to something else at some point during that and i find that it's kind of often quite a common experience that yeah a lot of people find their attention wanders off this is a normal human thing and, I've, and i find it's always very reassuring to have that group sense of yeah this is the kind of thing that happens we're designed our neurology is designed to have our attention grabbed by stuff faster than we consciously able to control that so it's going to happen and mindfulness is about noticing when that happens or part of it and then having more choice about coming back into a chosen focus maybe then the other questions i'd like to ask is more around the different um kind of senses we worked with there we with vision hearing and that sense of contact and really i'd like to have a kind of popularity poll here for who was kind of into a particular one so those who found that kind of vision looking at something kind of drew you in was easier to come back with that was just your kind of preferred sensation to work with we call it an anchor maybe who would go for for vision so i'm actually not that into vision but i can clearly see some people are and maybe some folk are in a yeah it's actually quite definite there what about hearing how about hearing so i'm, I'm actually quite into hearing myself some hmm, not so sure's and yeah kind of a mix there and what about the feeling of contact there so I'm, I'm kind of quite into the contact too actually but uh you can have more than one vote but some people hmm, less so sure with that so isn't that interesting that just this very quick poll we find out that some people are really into looking at stuff some people into hearing some people into contact and maybe some people are into actually none of those thank you very much Fisher Pani, do you have your hand up? No, um, no, no. Was that no. just a random thing? Yeah. Um, and I find this a really interesting way into beginning to offer kind of the experience of mindfulness for people because it very early on is starting to say, actually, how I do mindfulness might be how other different how other people do mindfulness. And if there's one message I'd really want to kind of share around this notion of trauma sensitivity or trauma responsiveness, however you want to talk about it is I think if we can help people recognize that how they do mindfulness is unique, that they actually are the expert in how they will experience mindfulness and the choices they can make about how to practice mindfulness. And if we can really honor that and empower people to trust their sense, yeah, they're going to be stumbling around in all kinds of ways when people are starting off. But if people and encouraged to trust their sense of yeah this is kind of my way of doing it and you have your way of doing it then actually i think a lot of what can be problematic about mindfulness tends to dissipate with that because people can say you know what what we're doing right now just isn't for me and i'm just gonna kind of let it float on by and i'm not going to force myself to get involved and i know that the facilitator here is okay with me having a different experience. I think that early communication that we have different experiences and I'm really fine with people to have um, a different experience from my own, I think helps people get more, um, feel more able to share, to say, you know what, that wasn't so good for me. That wasn't so easy. 
And I think one of the problems we have when we're working with um, people who often come in a very vulnerable kind of situation when they're starting to practice mindfulness is they're often desperately wanting something to be fixed, which is under, humanly understandable, um, that they may they don't know what mindfulness is, so they don't know how to make necessarily informed choices about how to work with the cultivation of mindful awareness in a way that's kind of good for them. And that we can underestimate the power of group conformity and that if people have strong perfectionist drivers, strong um, critical drivers, and maybe have experiences where they feel very vulnerable to share their experience in groups, then if you're the person who is struggling with a practice, and yet the round of inquiries had everyone going, oh, you know what, I just feel so chill. Oh, that was lovely. Oh, all those, as we can do, have people really into the practice we've just done. And you're thinking, well, that wasn't my experience. It was awful. I just, I feel really, really awful after that. You know, I, I struggle in group, you know, group meetings to sometimes express what I'm feeling and I'm a trained professional. What about someone coming into a context where into a group where they feel really vulnerable, they're at a low ebb in their life, they may have had a lot of setbacks and a lot of shaming that makes it very hard for that person to trust that that how they experience things will be welcomed. And so both um, welcoming in that sense of, hey, isn't it great how different people had a different experience there? but also actively asking for where people have struggled, um, I think is really useful. So, so if in maybe more of a kind of in-depth inquiry around a, a practice like that, we can begin to explore someone to say, well, was there any one of those sensors we're working with? You thought, actually, that, I really didn't like that. That kind of, you know, felt, I felt a bit edgy after that one. So I'm kind of inquiring into the possibility that maybe something didn't feel so good for someone. What I love doing actually is um, around listening practice is to um, guide some listening to sounds, but witter on continuously. And after that, there's usually someone who's really, really pissed off with me for talking all the way through that. And I hope that someone's got the courage to say, you know what, when we're doing that listening practice and I was just going on and on and on, was anyone thinking, I just wish he'd shut up. This is so frustrating. I can't do it because he's chattering away all the time. And if that can kind of come in with some humor around, it's okay for you to not like how I'm kind of offering this practice. I'm, I'm okay for you to say that wasn't good for me at all. I think we're helping create those, just this environment of openness to so the possibility of, of, of negative experiences. And I think things have moved on. I think maybe four or five years ago, there was a lot of grounds to be concerned about people who were kind of feeling silenced about the fact they were having very negative experiences in, in mindfulness groups. But there's a sort of a default assumption that this wouldn't be happening. And therefore, people felt unable to share with the facilitators that yeah that was actually really kind of unsettling for me um and i think maybe one of the good things about trauma sensitive mindfulness is it's kind of opened up the thought that hmm, can we be sure that everyone is is kind of okay with this and maybe we need to inquire into that a little bit more actively into inviting in negative experience um yeah, and any, I'm just curious, any kind of immediate reactions or thoughts um, around any of that, just as a sort of opening kind of set of, of ideas around that, that practice, really? Whether that's in the chat or audio. You do make me smile, Tim, because um, when I very first learned about mindfulness and I had my very first set of training, which was the Mindfulness in Schools programme, and we had, um, I won't say who they are, but we had some esteemed visitors um, on our, um, on one of our sits. 
and we've been doing an early sit in the morning so we were on a sort of a retreat in Oxford for a few days away we had some distinguished people coming in to do the sit with us and I was so worried and so conscious of the fact that I kept falling asleep during these practices in the beginning I I just couldn't I was just I was off and I was so worried that these important people I would snore that I decided I wasn't going to do the practice Uh I would just sit there and Mm. I would just just pretend so that I wouldn't fall asleep and I wouldn't snore and then actually what happened was I was so absorbed in trying to do this and trying to focus on not falling asleep (laughs) that I actually forgot to breathe at one point. And then I ended up actually actually going (laughs) and making a very strange snoring, you know, snorting noise, you know, in front of everybody. And, and I, and you talk about shame and I was like, Oh no, the very thing I was trying to avoid Mm. doing because my, my perception was that everybody should be doing this in a certain way. And all these very important people were there and, and so I didn't even benefit from the very yeah. important people mm. that were leading these wonderful, these wonderful yeah. mindfulness set. Mm. So yeah, Thanks. so it did yeah. make me smile. It took me back all the way back to 2009. Mm. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing that, Linda. I think that that sense of of shame, I think it's the the the, the fear of being seen to fail and and people's often really awful early educational experiences that often underpin a lot of that where we've been humiliated in in situations and that it's it's hard for people to trust this isn't going to be like that and that we're okay with stuff happening in all kinds of different ways um i remember working with a a group of quite vulnerable adults coming from gp referrals and there's a guy there who said, "Look, I've got a I've got a phone call that might happen. So if I need to go, I'll 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 kind of just have to leave." And I said, "That's fine." <clears throat> and we got to know him quite well. And he said, "You know what? That first session, that was just because I just thought this could be just another awful group where I was going to feel rubbish, and that was just my way of saying kind of escaping without feeling ashamed that I wasn't coping with the group." Um, so and and it's it is such a powerful thing and it and I think one of the things I've I suppose I've been privileged in this training is that I get often people sharing stories with me about how they've experienced being taught in mindfulness groups and how they've felt unable to share some of the really harrowing experiences they've had that have unbeknownst to the facilitator the facility has been absolutely well intentioned but something in the way it's been set up has meant that person has had maybe major triggering of traumatic experiences and they've not felt able to say any of that at all and it's and they've felt really isolated leaving the person often with not only have they got all that happening but they've kind of failed the mindfulness course as well and i just think it's it's a tragedy if people feel that something that could be so um, central to their healing, maybe, but actually because of those experiences of particular practices, they feel actually this isn't for me. And that's it's a real shame if that happens. <clears throat> I think it's important to recognise, though, that we, we cannot possibly offer any form of mindfulness teaching that isn't going to at times um, mean that some people react very strongly to elements <clears throat> excuse me of what um what we're offering we, we just cannot predict the amazing diversity of ways that which in which people can be affected by all kinds of stuff <clears throat> excuse me i've been doing um interviews all day so my throat's a bit uh, a bit dry <clears throat> um so so I think one of the, the risks, which I think you're alluding to a little bit before the session, Vishapani, around trauma sensitive mindfulness is we can kind of feel inhibited to do what we're doing um, because of the fear of, of something happening. And I actually don't think there's any way of avoiding something happening. But what we can do is we can um, make it so people feel safe to say, do you know what? that that I was struggling there and know that we're there with them in that and that we're going to be 
I was interested in their experience of a struggle as someone else saying, actually, I found that really helpful and that we're, we're kind of neutral in our compassionate curiosity into how people experience um, a mindfulness practice. And clearly that takes time to build up. Um, what I want to do is just very briefly share a couple of slides that I think are quite useful framing around this. And you've probably come across some of this before. So just let me bring this in. Here we go. So there's always a framing this notion of a, um, a kind of window of tolerance, working range, regulatory window, whatever language kind of floats your particular boat with this. I'm at the moment quite liking working window, but it comes and it goes. What it's saying is that our neurology is set up so that we have a social connection system, we have a, a part of our kind of autonomic nervous system that allows us to connect into our experience, other people's experiences, and brings with it a sense of steadiness and a capacity to learn new stuff. So we tend to only effectively learn when we're within this working window. And that if we stray outside this working window, then learning stops or starts to stop and reinforcement of, of, of kind of past ways of getting through tends to occur. So we don't tend to do new stuff. We just revisit other ways we've got through these kind of difficult situations. So if we kind of move out of that working window, one of the ways we can do that is to go into our kind of fight flight, sympathetic sort of system, this hyper arousal system, where we get more and more anxious, angry, kind of fearful, those kind of active, sympathetic kind of reactions. Or we may find that we cut off. So there's more kind of older part, we could say, of the parasympathetic system that takes us towards the kind of freezing, towards this kind of shutdown reaction. Um, we get through by disengagement, of by numbing out. And in some ways, the kind of alarm, the panicky, kind of rage sort of reactions are a bit more obvious when they're happening. Sometimes maybe as a mindfulness teacher, it's harder to spot when people go into this cut off and shut down because, you know, someone being kind of still from a kind of mindfully present, but just still with what's happening kind of way can look a little bit similar, maybe to someone who's disengaged and is kind of disappearing into their own kind of ways of just getting through. Um, but for me, the really important thing is that is that our learning only happens effectively when we're inside this working window and are just dipping in and out of alarm and cut off. Once we get into kind of rage or panic or full shutdown, learning really stops. And what we're doing is we're reinforcing old habits. And so the question I have really is how do we help people stay in their window? because that's where they're going to be learning to be mindful effectively. And I would say where I find quite helpful to frame this is to say whenever we're learning anything new, but mindfulness in particular, there's a, <clears throat> there's a familiar, familiarization phase where we're just kind of getting to know how this works, how we kind of sit with it. What's the metaphor for me is a bit like learning to drive. There's the bit where you just sat in the car, you're not moving, and you're just getting a feel of the levers and the steering wheel and the mirrors and all that stuff. You're just kind of getting to know the kind of the, the kind of background feel of it. And then what we can hopefully start to experience as we're learning mindfulness is how the how we can work with our attention to have an experience of feeling steadier of moving back into that working window 
as we start to find practices that are helpful for us. And that in time, having found a way of steadying, we can then start resilience building by dipping into alarm or cut off, and maybe even at times into panic and shut down, but finding our ways back, developing our ability to come back into that steadier working window. And as we practice that over time, then that working window widens. So the stuff that at the start of the course would have thrown us into maybe the beginnings of panic, by the end of that training, actually, we're kind of okay with that. We may not like it, we may still feel unsettled by it, but we know we're okay. You know you're going to get through this okay. And a very different kind of feel then. And I'm sure as mindfulness teachers, it's one of the excitements about seeing that development um, of people over the over a course is that they kind of have that sense of of growing resilience in contexts where they just were overwhelmed before. And we'll come back in maybe to the sessions with stories of, do you know what? This thing I've been really struggling with, I was kind of okay. I got through that in a way I didn't never imagined I could do. And and I think that's such a, a profound thing to be able to share that learning with people. But I I suppose one of the things I think is can be problematic is that we sometimes ask people to have the skills that are going to be there at the end of the course and actually want people to have those at the beginning of the course we jump in maybe a little bit too fast for some people and that's where it gets i think a little bit trickier where maybe you know 90 percent, 95 percent of a group we're working with are absolutely fine with the pacing but what about maybe some of the folk there who are not so good with that things are happening a little bit too fast a little bit too much all at once and there's some struggle going on there are the ways that we can um, offer what we're doing that actually helps people in that situation still engage in the course without maybe feeling they've got to shut down and kind of disappear or um, pretend things are okay when they're not or maybe just disengage from the course entirely any kind of any responses reactions to that kind of notion of that sort of staging of of, of how we might move towards resilience building as a, as a kind of model that we might use tonight does that seem to make kind of sense okay or not Okay, so what I'd like to do is really use quite a concrete example of how we might approach a very common sort of practice, and that's a body-based practice, doing a body scan type practice. How might, how might we approach that in a way that perhaps would help people who might otherwise struggle with body-based um, practice? Because one of the things that's emerging from the research around folk who struggle with mindfulness, um, particular mindfulness practices, is that if people have past experience of trauma that's that's kind of anchored into their body, if people have specific areas of the body associated with particular traumatic experiences, if people have physical health problems that they're really struggling with associated with the body, and similarly with the breath that our breath is so connected to our experience of emotion and our embodied feeling that to come into our embodied sense of body and breath maybe for some people brings into awareness experiences that they've been doing very well so far thank you very much for keeping at some kind of distance and things come in a little bit too fast a little bit too soon and maybe in a context they don't feel safe to have that sudden contact with what's previously been kind of held at a distance. And that may be, that may mean that their experience of that mindfulness practice, rather than something that's a pathway to healing, actually is kind of, kind of triggering of trauma or may even be traumatic in its own right. It may leave very, very strong memories that, that, is yet another thing for that person to work with. Um, 
And I think some of the ways we might approach this, first of all, <clears throat> is to be really clear on our signposting. <clears throat> I remember in some of the teaching and training I had years ago, there was a kind of notion of wanting to encourage beginner's mind by springing everything on people as a surprise. And I think that's okay for experts who might need a bit of beginner's mind, but these are beginners. They've already got it, so they don't need more of this stuff. So one of the things I think is really helpful for people is a notion of informed consent. So it's so like when I did with that looking, listening, and holding an object practice, this is what we're gonna do. Have a, just to kind of run that through in your mind, get a bit of a feel of that. How does that kind of sit with you? Is there any bits of that you might want to be more cautious about or not? Just letting people know what's coming up. So if I'm going to do a body based practice, I'll be kind of saying just that I'm going to do a practice now where we might bring our attention into um, a particular area of the body and to notice how it is to be aware of the sensations there. The other thing around this I think that's really helpful is framing what we do initially as a test drive. I find this language so helpful to say, we're going to give this a bit of a test drive. Let's see what happens if we do this. You might find this is something you really kind of get into. You might find this is one you think, hmm, not so much for me. So I'm, I'm allowing that notion of being experimental kind of into the mix kind of quite early on. And then the third thing around this, so we've got this kind of signposting, we've got the test drive kind of notion, <clears throat> is then around brevity. Let's just do a little bit and see how it goes, rather than doing a huge long practice. Because if you're in a old style classic Cabot Zinn on your back, body scan, 45 minutes, let's remorse as he goes through every little nook and cran of your body without missing any bits out kind of body scan and you know by the time you've got to your ankle you're thinking goodness this isn't for me and you're flat on your back in a group of people you've barely met and you've been given maybe quite a strong impression at times of well if you notice any difficulty just notice it and let it flow by or or just let that be part of your experience and even maybe encouragements not to move so if you notice you want to move, just notice the feeling of wanting to move, but maybe just let that feeling of wanting to move be. There can be so many strong messages of saying there's a right way to do this. And what on earth do you do if you're in that situation? Are you really going to get up? And maybe you've got physical health issues that make it hard to get up and get out of that room because it's awful. And you've got 40 odd minutes left of this. It's this isn't the time to discover this isn't for you at this point. So I would say so chunking down small practices and doing a little bit of it and then getting getting some reflections back, having an inquiry into that early on, then we can get a feel of what how this has been with the group and maybe make some on the hoof adjustments if someone's saying you know what that really wasn't for me um so um and 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 kind of thinking around around that maybe so should we do a little bit of that so what i'm going to invite us to do maybe is to just have a brief test drive of what it's like to bring our attention into um an area of the body and i'm going to suggest starting with the soles of of your feet. Now, if there's anything happening with the soles of your feet that that isn't a comfortable place to put your attention, you could go for the palms of your hands. Or if kind of none of those areas are particularly helpful for you, maybe just kind of, is there anywhere that's kind of seems a sort of a neutral sort of place to start with this? Or maybe this is just a practice, if you're not sure about this, just kind of be a bit disengaged from it and just see how it goes dip in and out of it so kind of let's let's find out at the end of doing it how that was for you so um and what we're going to do is notice one foot and then the other foot or you might be substituting one hand 
and then the other hand and just see what that's like to move our attention into one part of the body and then shift it to another and as i say as we go along feel free to be as engaged or as disengaged with this as you feel is right for you so starting off then maybe noticing what it's like to bring your attention down into your left foot and just getting a kind of baseline feel of what sensations are there now maybe there's hardly anything at all it's this vague goodness what is going on there barely anything to notice you could always move your foot a bit just to kind of get a feel of yeah actually that's i've got more of a sense of that by moving it around a bit absolutely fine maybe there's a sense of contact in the soles of your feet maybe there's a feeling of your footwear in some way it could be temperature maybe there's a feeling of movement and if you're someone whose feet just kind of move a bit twitch a bit that's absolutely fine they don't need to be still for this practice just kind of notice what's there really and then maybe pick out something in particular so it could be maybe the sensations in the soles of your feet it could be a toe or the feeling of temperature contact there notice the details of that the notice when your attention slips away somewhere else how is it to come back to what you're noticing there in your foot Just staying with that for 20 seconds or so, just a little bit of time, just to get a feeling of doing that. Noticing the details, but then also really noticing when your attention has wandered off elsewhere. Gently bring your attention back from whatever's caught your attention. And if you're finding this isn't for you, that's okay, just disengaging. Take your attention to something else. And then maybe see what it's like to have a sense of you choosing to shift your attention to the other foot. So letting your attention move from one foot. So that goes more into the background now. And then bring your other foot into the foreground of your attention. Maybe this is your right foot. It's so really focusing in on the details there. Picking out maybe particular sensations you can notice, if there are any to be noticed. And when your attention wanders off, as it probably already has done, how is it to bring your attention back once more to what you're noticing there? And then maybe just broadening your attention out to have more of a sense of maybe what you're hearing around you. Sounds you can hear, stuff you can see, maybe picking out something to look at. Maybe shifting, moving, stretching, bringing that to an end. And so by having a, a kind of a brief kind of practice like that, there's an opportunity to discover from people how that was to have some embodied awareness, which is one of the kind of learning outcomes of a of a body scan that we we start to engage in embodied awareness and some engagement with that notion of, of of shifting our attention from one place to another that sort of that, that movement of our attention focus of our attention which is another kind of thing we're we're 
experiencing there. But for me, because that's brief, I framed it as a test drive. And if I do an inquiry into that and explore with people, what did you notice there? What was kind of going on? Who found their attention wandered off? Who maybe if we have done some practices before, like a looking, a listening, how is that in comparison to those? Did anyone find, think, hmm, actually this was easier to kind of engage with, less easy? What was happening there? And I'd always be asking anyone finding kind of anything not so easy about that. Um, did anyone have any kind of aches in their their feet or their hands that kind of stood out more when they were noticing that? That that was. And how was that to to become aware of maybe something that's less comfortable as part of that practice? So we kind of laying down the notion that it's okay to share where maybe we've noticed difficulty. Um, and having done um, some feet, we could then say, well, what do you reckon about doing doing some legs? Let's let's do the legs next, shall we? So let's take that through the whole of the legs and do a body scan um, to the legs, and then maybe another check in, and then maybe uh, we could have a go. I quite like doing loops, so going up one leg and down the other, then doing a loop from one hand over to the other side. And then maybe doing a torso loop from the base of the body up the back and down the front, um, which then off, offers the opportunity to say, well, how are legs compared to arms and how are arms compared to torso? And any of those you think, hmm, not so sure I'd want to do that bit again, or actually I'm okay with all of that. And one of the great things about breaking a body scan up like this is actually the chance of people falling off to sleep is much reduced, which... Um, and that includes me as a person guiding it quite often. But the the um, that sense of, well, I don't see anything wrong at all with people sleeping in a mindfulness practice because it gives them that opportunity of of noticing what happens in that mindful awareness of waking up. is always a valuable experience. But still, it may not mean they're getting as much learning as they could um, if they have just dropped off to sleep, whereas if we chunk the practice and have feedback, it also may mean that actually at the end of the first session, you get as far as the legs. And is that a bad thing? It's, there's, I think almost for me, I know when I first started learning about doing body scans, a kind of magical thinking that I have to do the whole body and someone's going to kind of walk out weirdly lopsided if I miss this body part out. Some, it, it, it's okay to do a bit. We don't have to do everything um, because the point of the practice is to begin the process of embodiment, to begin the process of noticing how it is to take our attention through areas of our body that have different experiential qualities and that shifting of attention. And it's okay to do that with just legs, I would say. We don't have to do the whole thing. And that, to me, often takes a bit of the rush out that can be in many of the kind of standard curriculums where if we get into a really juicy conversation with lots of really useful reflection, if you feel you've got to do a whole body in the body scan, I don't know about you, but it, it can get a bit twitchy thinking, well, how am I going to, I won't have time to do all that if I'm, if I'm giving space to this kind of group process, whereas actually can we be okay i would put as an idea to say you know what we've we've learned the kind of core process there actually if there's an audio that people can listen to then maybe they can try other bits out themselves and i'll send you a link to an example of a of a looped body scan that i've done that is in this kind of chunked fashion i'm just wondering there vishwapandi and yeah and uh uh, Liz and uh, Gwen and um, do you think that might be a useful point just to have a bit of a breakout room here just to have some reflections on kind of where we've been so far and people's kind of thoughts maybe for a little maybe till about five past just a few minutes there just to um, just to kind of reflect on any of those ideas about chunking signposting how that kind of sits with you, any queries you'd have about that, any applications to other practices you think um, might be useful to bring into a conversation. How many would you like in a room, Tim? Three-ish, maybe three to fours, do you think? Okay, let's go. 
see if I can do the sims <laughs> if it's not your thing to be in a breakout room then just we may need to shuttle people around a bit but um okay let's uh let's go see what happens Okay, Gwen Ann, would would you like to go? Do you want to go or do you want to stay? I'm happy to There's go. A song in there I'm somewhere. I'm happy to go. Oh. Yeah, there's one with two in there, so I'll put you in that one to okay. allocate six. There's a couple with two in. That's okay. I just was um yeah. oh. sometimes if people don't join. I've lost it. it. Um, where am I? Where am I supposed to go? So room six. You should just be able to click join. Yeah, but it's it's disappeared. Okay. <laughs> Playing with you. Uh, well, that's fine, Emma. Don't feel uh, yeah, there's no no problem. Oh, I, I, I can't. All right, room room six. Okay. You okay? Can you join it? Yeah. Join room six. Welcome back, everyone. So yeah, I'm really curious to find out any anything coming out of those discussions, anything that was kind of triggered by any of that in terms of kind of thoughts, applications, or sense of actually I'm not sure about this at all. Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't be for me. Anyone care to kind of come in with any of the discussions you've been having? Yeah, hi. Chris. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to share something that's quite personal, but I think it's okay. actually really helpful. Um, so I, I have a history of trauma and I didn't know that I had. I was actually quite severely traumatized. And so being diagnosed with depression and anxiety and then going through the Improving Access to Psychological Therapies service not having it recognised, but having counselling and then going to do an M NHS MBCT course. This was in 2016. So, you know, things have changed quite a lot in that time. It wasn't a trauma sensitive teaching style. And the day one of an MBCT course is a full body scan. And so... I just wanted to echo back a lot of what you'd said earlier. You know, you're basically lying down in a small room with people that you don't know next to people's feet and whatever, struggling to lie down on a very, very thin mat. I couldn't move. I actually physically couldn't move, but I also didn't feel able to move because that wasn't even given as a an option or to sit in a chair or have your eyes open or anything else. And then the experience of, you know, I already knew, but didn't feel able to verbalize that if I lie down on a hard surface, I know my mood is going to crash because I was in so much pain. And then the re, you know, the inquiry afterwards, you know, my mood had dropped. And 
my experience was nothing like anyone else's. Mm. My experience wasn't, oh, my mind was wandering. My experience was, how am I even going to get up off the floor? Mm. And do I even want to continue? Mm. But that wasn't something that, you know, was kind of able to share in a constructive way. Yeah. Because, you know, I'd already been doing, uh, but I'd been doing some Mark Williams stuff at home in my own space, which felt different. Mm -hmm. So I knew that there was a benefit from practicing mindfulness, but that that kind of vulnerability that, uh, you know, the unfamiliarity of the people and the space, they don't know what's going on. So that echoing that um, <clears throat> having the choice giving those signposting that 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 sense that actually yeah I was the person who wanted to get it right fix myself you know yeah, all of those course. things all of the reasons to want to do it and mm. to stick with it and actually all that happened was that you know I I was a wreck at the end of it uh. so having those choices it's just it's so refreshing to hear you know and um People may have heard of David Trelevin, but, you know, the yeah. having those choices, I can't emphasize enough because many people won't even like me realize that they're dealing with trauma. Yeah. And so assume that everyone is traumatized unless you know otherwise. I think that's mm. that's the way to go. Thank you so much, Chris. I think it's really, really important what you're saying there. And, and I think really valuable to have that first hand experience that um, I think is so much more powerful than kind of relating kind of secondhand as I'm doing really. Um, and for me, there's a really important thing. One of the very important things you're saying in that around that, that sense of, of kind of choice and is, is recognized, as I said, right at the start, I think that the, the reasons why people are on the course in the first place, will often include motivations like you're saying getting it right there may be also other people have perfectionism they may have very strong critical drivers where they've kind of got the impression mindfulness will be good for me so i'm going to force myself to do it so that people can be starting with very very strong kind of underlying motivating forces that actually may be part and parcel of why they've got struggles in life anyway and I, I like the, you know, the three circle system from compassion focused therapy. So notion we've got the drive system that kind of gets us doing stuff. We've got the defense system or threat system, which kind of helps us kind of avoid, kind of seek safety or back off from what's too much. And then we've got the soothing system that can regulate both that drive and that um, uh, threat or defense system. And I think a really interesting question to ask is what system are people using to get through their life? And what system does our teaching <clears throat> style tend to encourage? And I think there's the kind of classic John Kabat-Zinn notion of just do it anyway. I think for me, it's a very strong drive system and has a risk that unless we can do notice that drive system mindfully and self-compassionately we risk actually reinforcing the very things that are we're entangled in that we're on the mindfulness cause anyway to try and find some freedom from and so i think the one of the other things i would say around kind of teaching is the notion of at the beginning of a course i find it really helpful to encourage people by saying if you've noticed you've had enough of this practice, stop. So if you're listening to an audio or listening to me or doing anything, and you've just got to a point when you say, you know, I've had enough, that's enough for me, is I would frame that this is a moment of mindful self-compassion when you've noticed your experience and you've got the opportunity to act on that noticing in a really mindful way. And, and what's it like to stop doing what you're doing, that you know, stop doing that practice. And I think this is really, really helpful for people in terms of safety, because it's, 
is when we push past the point of I want to stop now or like you're saying Krista I'm in a situation where I'm kind of socially kind of imprisoned really and I'm being pushed into this and there's some quite strong messages coming out like don't move or be on the floor to do this right then goodness that we're missing out the opportunity to have that mindful the cultivation of mindful self-compassion to say that's enough actually and, and i think i would agree with you i think that is critical it's there's mindfulness but then there's the compassion aspect towards um all of that and understanding that not something as you've already said sometimes not continuing or changing the practice is an act of compassion and mindfulness itself is learning to how best take care of ourselves yeah and framing it as as that and that might be different for everybody mm. but then i think with that then once people have got that ah so maybe as we get further into the course and we're doing a little bit of moving towards difficulty so if people can get ah, i can be kind of compassionately curious mindfully curious about this less pleasant experience that to me then is the point where i can say well i want to stop but i'm just going to do a little bit more i'm just going to notice how my mind starts going nuts because i'm full of all kinds of stuff that it wants me to do or reasons to stop i'm just going to hang around and just notice that maybe just for a couple of breaths just to get a bit of a feel of that and then i'm going to stop so I can be curious about the not stopping quite yet. But if I can do that with mindful curiosity and compassion, then that's a rich learning experience. But if I'm actually just reinforcing maybe a lifelong <clears throat> habit of just pushing myself through to <clears throat> do stuff, well, do I really want mindfulness to be wrapped up in yet another bit of my kind of deep seated motivations around um kind of self-criticism or perfectionism or um or kind of social compliance or whatever might be kind of around for me with with doing things so um yeah thanks again thanks so much for that crystal any other reflections coming out on any of this i have a question uh -huh. tim if i may please yeah, it's about um, gender, just whether you've noticed any gender differences. And my concern with with this, I mean, I, I totally get what you're saying, and I think it's really important. But I, uh, I, well, first of all, I noticed that there are far more women than men on mindfulness courses. So there's something about the, the overall message of of mindfulness that seems to appeal more to women yeah. and i'm quite interested in how how to talk to men about mindfulness and men are definitely subject to all of these things you're talking about the, the trauma but how can we talk to men without sort of um making it seem like they're weak I, sus mm -hmm. I suspect the men will take some of these messages about, you know, reassurance and uh, being gentle and all that as as a as a sort of an affront. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just wonder what your thoughts are about that. Mm, I think it's, it's such a good point. Um, I think that um, I think one of the things I find working with men is that often humor is really important in the mix it's a kind of a, i think men often have a are socialized into being quite distant from many emotions maybe a little bit more access perhaps to kind of anger aggression is is socially normed maybe than um kind of is socially normed for women um but um humor if kind of kind humor is I think often a way that men can kind of engage in quite an embodied experience of humor. So I think the sort of having that lightness around is quite helpful. Um, and I think um, for me, 
the, the the language is really important so i tend to use language like being on your own team being on your own side um giving yourself a bit less of a hard time that kind of language i've actually for both men and women i find that tends to sit better for people who've got very strong self-criticism than quite they're quite big words to hear like kindness to self or self-compassion i think those may be too big for people to hear but maybe they can get a bit of a sense of well you know that's a really tough situation you're talking about there and i'm wondering what it might be like if you were kind of a little bit if you had your back there because it sounds like you're kind of giving yourself a bit of a hard time at that moment what what might that be like um and so you know finding someone who said well they, they can maybe talk about very strong drivers to do things so i'm you know well i made sure i did my 10 minute practice or my 20 minute practice i say so when you were kind of was there a, was there a moment in doing that practice when you thought you know what i've had enough of this i've just kind of I've, yeah i've got to the end of what i want to do but yeah i just well, yeah, i kind of carried on because that's kind of what i do but did you notice any sense of of that I'm just just kind of floating it as something to be curious about saying um how about next time pausing just for a few moments at that point just kind of break the practice then and then just ask yourself do you want to carry on or not do if, if you want to find if you don't find what kind of happens so kind of offering these things as an experiment to in in kind of awareness rather than i suppose um framing it too much in the language if if that feels more distant for someone of of self-compassion mm. uh, because i think that's it's a it's a big thing for people to to have that and i think if we have got very strong self-criticism drivers they get pushed very quickly by anything that smacks of like you're saying being kind of um giving up or giving in is it can be too much to hear mm. whereas almost framing is the challenge can you spot can you pick that up because that is such a crucial thing to notice so i'm kind of bigging up the noticing if there's going to be any i suppose um kind of within any group there's always stuff that we kind of will will kind of frame as being um as a kind of a, a good a good of that group an outcome of that group and if we're framing it's the noticing is what we're really after here um what i'll, I'll shadow have you come across the matrix model at all by kevin polk i'll share a link to this because the language they're quite quirky in the language they use but the model i think actually works really well um, around folk who's struggling with seeing why they might want to do mindfulness because it frames mindfulness in terms of saying asking the question what matters to you in your life and or who matters to you in your life and what gets in what gets between you and being kind of satisfied with the way you're going towards the stuff that matters to you in your life and and that notion of well, what gets in the way often I think is quite clarifying um, for people who may struggle with more reflective it, it gives them a reflective tool I think to see why mindfulness might be useful so I'll share some links um, to that I don't know if that's at all helpful which it may not be but um, it is I mean one of the things that's helpful is just your tone really the the sort of light tone um, and the, the curious tone which it, it just makes me think we 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 need maybe different tones for different people, mm -hmm. which of course then raises the question: How can you do that in a group where there are different kinds of people? Yeah. But no, the, the, your tone and 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 the, the ways you're talking, I think, I'll be fine in for for men, but also not just men. I mean, so you put it in terms of people who are self-critical or hard on themselves which is men and women yeah. i think the other thing as well is um is, is kind of meeting people where they are and i think one of the 
problems about mindfulness it is infested isn't it with these images of people in lycra sitting on damp sand in odd mo yoga positions that i've never done that in my life you know so and it's kind of that's quite alienating so sometimes i think it's quite useful to kind of name that but maybe coming back to a point you're making there chris as well around um that of inclusivity so you know why do we ask people to go onto the floor when maybe the thing that's brand new for them is body-based awareness and it's enough to be sat in a chair beginning to notice sensations in your body that may be such a radical shift of your attention that you've reached saturation with that thank you very much but to add into that and not only that you're going to be on the floor in a position you've never done before and and all of that extra stuff maybe um just kind of takes people beyond their capacity to um to feel okay and and if you've and if you're in a situation where you're made to feel this isn't right for me, then maybe absenting yourself from that situation has been your typical habit in the past. Um, so um, we're coming towards an end there. I don't know if there's any other kind of reflections, things. Yes, that, yes. Yeah. I wonder if I could ask you, are there any observations on um, how the impact of, of online deep teaching uh, in terms of in terms of uh, trying to introduce an actual in the sense of mm. I'm I'm really torn with it because the one the great thing for me about online is a bit like maybe you were saying, Chris, is that when you're doing things in your own space, you can feel really it's a space you're going to be doing your practice anyway, possibly. So if you if you feel hopefully safe in the place you're learning online to do mindfulness then actually when the camera goes off and the the session is at an end you're in the very same place you'll be doing your practice so you've got that kind of lived experience already of doing it at home which i think is great you can also engage and disengage maybe a little bit more easily online but then as but then I think we lose something in that immediacy of that the group feel of when just as a kind of in when we're all together in person, there's something just so precious about that powerful group feel when we've been somewhere together and something's happened as yeah, there's some of that happens online still. But I think there's that real embodied connection, I feel myself anyway, that I miss from the kind of online only kind of aspects of things i don't know what's your sense of that mike well i i've been kind of quite pleasantly surprised i think in terms of uh, the, the, the clinical groups that i've i've been taking over the last three years and it's been it's, i think um it, it, this, this idea of uh feeling safe and, and choice uh it seems to feature that you know, noticing it now um for people who who perhaps would have struggled in a in a in a group mm. would have found yeah. it very difficult. Um and, and actually uh, it, it strikes me it's probably more suited for people who uh, have a, a, a an underlying trauma. Yeah. They their their comfort zone is not quite so pushed and yeah. They have the I'd agree. That that probably matches my I kind of hanker after some of that kind of in person experience, but generally I've found it's worked so well and and for many people has meant it's accessible. I would one little thing I would I have a bit of a be in my bonnet about is giving people choice about having the cameras on or off. There's some courses that are just so bossy about in my mind about saying you've got to have your camera on. And I think that's quite a big thing to be practicing, possibly feeling like you're in a goldfish bowl with everyone else around you. So, but that that's just my personal bugbear. But that we are now at eight thirty. Yes. So, thank you so much. The really interesting uh, reflections there. Obviously, we can only just have a little snippet of a bit of a kind of wander through some of this stuff. But I hope that's been kind of useful in terms of some ideas to to share. And, and nothing I've said is I'm not in any way saying this is the right way of doing it. It's more about raising kind of questions for reflection. And I think that's the important thing in this is reflecting on what we're doing not feeling there's 
I think it'd be trauma insensitive to think there is a right way of doing something and that's that would be risky so uh, yeah hopefully food for reflection really so look thank you very much tim and um i will we'll, we'll be sending out an email um with the video uh, for everyone who's um signed up not just the people who are able to make it to this session and if you're able to if you have anything in mind that would be helpful in terms of resources yeah, I'll share you, that. Yeah. or anything like that that people could could follow up with yeah then please, if you send that to us then we can pass that on. yeah happy to do so so i'll send way. a few bits and bobs yeah. yeah okay well thank you very much um i think this is really important it's changed how i teach and how i think about teaching and try and train other people um and it just makes so much sense because if we're dealing with mindfulness we're going to be in the realm of vulnerability sense um and trauma you know we're we're offering ourselves to help people who have difficulties so there will be difficulties we need to know how to how to work skillfully with those Please wish Lovely. Lovely. Great to see you all.